Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, a place to find connection and a sense of belonging, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we talk about sensitivity and the richness that it adds, the strengths we have because of our sensitivity, and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. The creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. I'm really glad you're here today. We are currently in, I think, week 10 or 11 of COVID. I'm not sure when you're going to be hearing this episode, but today's date is May 27th, 2020, and you'll understand why that's relevant as we go on. This is a really amazing episode with Lee Shea McDonough. We talk about a number of things. One of the things that I love is we really talk about the differences between therapy and coaching, and we challenge the idea that therapy is about the past and coaching is about the present and how we need to weave in our past and bring it into the present if we're going to do healing with coaching. So I, I really love that. Lee talks about entrepreneurship and the cycles of regression that when we grow, Lee experiences what she calls cycles of regression. We talk about the Clifton Strengths Finder because we talk about connectedness and many HSPs are able to make connections between concepts and ideas. Lee talks about how, for her, empathy could negatively impact her work when she had clients in therapy, and that if she had too much empathy, she would join them too much, and it it prevented her from helping them move through what was going on. And I think that this can be true for those of us that have a lot of empathy. When we have so much empathy for the other person, either it impacts how we feel when we're around them, or it prevents us from taking care of ourselves because we over-identify with them and we kind of lose what's going on with ourselves. And Lee talks about every strength that we have has a shadow side. Lee talks about her intuition and how it's always spot on. What happens often is that we fuse with a thought or event and it can create some limitations for us. And with acceptance and commitment therapy, what often happens is we fuse with the thoughts and we run away from the emotions. And so acceptance commitment therapy helps to create some balance between the two. And that includes looking at meaning, mindset, and mindfulness. We also get onto the subject of George Floyd and we take a detour given the political climate and what just happened to George Floyd. It felt really relevant and important to do this. After Lee and I stopped recording, she gave me the resource for somebody that I can bring onto the podcast that we can talk about some of the racial disparity and inequity. I feel really inadequate in my language in talking about this, and I recognize that I have a ton of white privilege, and I feel really inadequate in my ability to even talk about it. But it's something that, especially as someone who's got white privilege, I want to do right by the disparity that we have. Let me tell you a little bit about Lee. I, I, I do think you're going to enjoy this episode. Oh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is Lee gives this personal example of having a job and being called the smart one and that message of being too smart for her own good and that sense of having to make herself small. And I asked her a question after it and thinking that she was going to say no, and she kind of went down this path that made me feel kind of bad. So we we really had a chance to look at When we get messages from someone about us, is it about them? Is it about something we're doing? Is it hitting on something from our past that is no longer present? Is there something that we need to change? Like, how do we look at that? And I think that's a really important piece to look at because I think this comes up for many of us when we get messages about how we're showing up in the world and really wanting to be able to sort through that. Let me tell you a little bit about Lee. Lee Shea McDonough is the CEO and founder of Coach with Clarity, a membership site for intuitive, heart-centered coaches. She's also the host of the Coach with Clarity podcast and author of the number one Amazon book, Act on Your Business. After over a decade as a clinical social worker and public health professional, Lee became credentialed as a coach through the International Coach Federation and now provides ICF-accredited continuing coach education for intuitive, heart-centered coaches. 
Lee lives in North Carolina with her husband, two sons, and her pug, Phineas. If you want to read her full bio and anything from the this episode, it's in the show notes at unapologeticallysensitive.com. Click on the podcast tab and then click on Lee's episode. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can help me out by rating and reviewing in the show notes. I have instructions on how to do that. If you're comfortable sharing an episode, if you're in social media or talking with a friend and you've heard an episode that you think would be helpful, please share the podcast. It's growing phenomenally, and I just want to continue to spread the message. All right, and now on to the show. Haley, welcome. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here today. I'm really excited to be talking to you, and today is a very special day. Happy birthday, Lee. You're recording on your birthday. We are. Thank you so much. I can't think of any other way I would rather spend my birthday than podcasting. (laughs) It's a it's a COVID podcast birthday. Yes, it is a very COVID (laughs) birthday. (laughs) Yeah, my kids are turning 20 on Friday and I had COVID put on their cake COVID birthday because it just is. Yeah. And at this point, we may as well just welcome it in, make room for it, accept it because it's here, whether we want it to be or not. So I know I've had a couple tantrums on the side and I imagine I will continue to be tantruming as well as embracing. It's all part of the process. Yep, it is. Lee, do you identify as a highly sensitive person? We've never really talked about this too much before. I have always identified as someone with highly sensitive traits, and I never really knew whether I had enough of those traits to qualify as an HSP. And interestingly, when I take kind of the classic assessment, I am right on the borderline. And what I find is that in certain aspects of my life and my work, my HSP tendencies come out very strongly. And then in other aspects of my life, they don't. So I would say that I'm I'm a bit of a hybrid, but I definitely have some strong tendencies. Yeah, I, I really wonder, I would love to talk to more people that really did not have a difficult childhood, because I think that we learn to adapt and don't struggle with some of the traits. I'm I'm feeling a little nervous about how this is coming out because I haven't thought about saying this before. But when we get negative messages about how we show up, then I think we're more aware. But when our traits are really embraced and that we integrate it as a positive aspect of ourselves, then I think that there are certain areas that we struggle less because it wasn't an issue. I, I don't know how that lands with people and I may ruminate over this and want to retract it. No, no. To me, that sounds like a really solid hypothesis because it really is about integration and how we've, you know, with any traumatic event, people are going to interpret that event differently. They're going to respond to it differently. And so the idea that maybe we would integrate that experience differently would absolutely shape how how those HSP traits show up. So I I personally think you're onto something there. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We're going to talk a little bit today about your transition from therapy to coaching. Where's a good place to start? I think the best place to start is June of 2015. So we'll go back almost five years to when my husband and my two kids and I were living in Germany because he was in the Air Force and we were stationed at a base overseas. And together we made the decision that it was the right time to leave the Air Force life and move back to the United States, enter the civilian world. My husband is a periodontist by training. So he's a dentist and a specialist. And there was an opportunity in his home state of North Carolina to purchase a dental practice. And so in 2015, we made a huge life change. We moved back home, we bought a practice, and I took some time off from the world of psychotherapy in order to really focus on my family and to support everyone in this transition. Because when we moved to Germany, my kids were four and two. So moving back, they were eight and six. They, especially my youngest, had very few memories of America. They had gotten very accustomed to the European way of doing things. And so I just suspected that there was going to be some culture shock and some issues transitioning back into schools. And not to mention the fact that we're now business owners. So I decided for a while my full-time job was simply going to be kind of the hub of the wheel, making sure that everyone and everything was okay and getting done. And after about six to nine months of that, I started getting the itch to return to my professional identity. And yet on some level, I knew that therapy or, or mental health was not, I wasn't feeling as called to it as I was earlier in my career. 
I knew I still wanted to show up and, and help people and support people and be a part of, of their journeys. But I was really interested in, in finding other ways of doing so. Uh, around the same time, you know, my husband, we moved in June. He formally purchased the practice on January 1st, 2016. And he had been trying to figure out how to be both clinician and owner. And it's very hard to balance those two roles, but it's especially hard when you've never owned a business. You didn't go to business school. The Air Force or dental school don't prepare you for that. And so he was having this experience of feeling extraordinarily competent in the clinical side, because he is. He is a fantastic surgeon. But the business side was brand new to him. And he was, you know, at a, at a novice level, which is exactly where he should be. And there's that special tension where it's difficult to reconcile being so good in one area and a beginner in another. And that is just a breeding ground for self-doubt and mindset issues. And I was observing this as his partner and trying to support him that way. But my clinician side kept saying, there's something here. You know, you've seen this before. My background was in acceptance and commitment therapy. So the idea of doing mindset work was very comfortable to me. And so as I'm observing my husband going through this, I couldn't help but think like, there have to be more people like him out there who are experiencing these same challenges. And perhaps they don't need therapy or even want therapy, but they do want some support around their professional identity and their businesses. And that's what led me to do some research and realize that coaching could be a way to marry my background and experience and wisdom as a therapist with this audience that I really wanted to serve. And so that's what kind of launched me into coaching. I completed a coach training program. I started my coaching business. And now here we are, May 27, 2020. And I'm, I'm doing exactly the work I love. And I've really kind of positioned now into helping other people enter the coaching profession so that they can serve the people they care about as well. That's really a powerful journey. Yes. And I have to say, like, as it was happening, it didn't feel nearly as smooth or step A leads to step B leads to step C. In in living it, it felt very chaotic and confusing. And there were certainly moments of uncertainty. It's really in hindsight where I'm able to look back and see these key moments and see the thread that weaves them all together. That it's like, okay, I see it now. And this is this all makes sense. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And everything that's happened in my life has brought me to this place right now where I'm able to do the work that I love. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important to talk about the struggles and the lack of clarity along the way. I think that people have this expectation that if I follow this recipe or this plan, it's going to be smooth sailing and that growth is linear upwards. And it's like, it's up, down, it's backwards. It's a wiggle around. And oftentimes when we feel like we're not succeeding and we're not hitting our marks, we're getting lessons in growth, we eventually get to where we want to be. But I think we have this experience that success is this exuberant, satisfying, fulfilling feeling. And if you just work hard and put your nose to the grindstone, you will get there. And it's about so much more and being present to all of those dips and bumps along the way. I couldn't agree with you more. Entrepreneurship for me has been a wonderful journey with a lot of low moments along the way. And those low moments have been my greatest lessons. So I don't regret them. I don't wish them away. They're a part of the process. You know, there's there's a meme out there that I'm sure many people have said and or, or seen rather. And, and it's like what I thought owning a business would be like. And it's that straight line up like like you talked about on, on the graph. And what it's really like is like this big tangled mess, right? Where it like, falls back on itself and it looks like a rat's nest, sort of kind of trending up, but it's really kind of this maze. And actually what I have found in my experience is that my journey looks like a hybrid of the two, where it is a line that that kind of heads up, you know, on the diagonal on the chart, and then it coils back on itself. So it's almost like it regresses. And then from there, it kind of shoots up even further up. So, okay, I've had some growth, I'm growing, and then up, oh, I'm coiling back on myself. And that has been my experience as a coach and as a business owner. And really, when I think about my whole life, that's what it's been like. I go through cycles of regression in my life. And what I've realized is that those are the moments where I'm being called to connect even more deeply with my intuition, with my inner wisdom with myself and to relearn some of the lessons of old and and figure out 
how they apply today. And it's only when I take the time to kind of have that retrograde experience and really honor it, that's then what allows me to continue to move forward. So for me, this idea of of a coil, that image of a coil is really powerful for me. And then when I hit those cycles of, of regression or retrograde, it doesn't feel as scary or difficult or unwanted because I understand what it is now and I understand its purpose and, and how it fits into my overall journey. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting as you were talking, I was, you know, relating that to how does that fit with what my experience is. I tend to, it's interesting when it comes to seeing patterns in what's going on with other people in the world with clients I have this really uncanny ability to pick out patterns and I think it's it's definitely a strength that I didn't realize that I had. In my own life, I tend to see the picture very close up and it's very hard for me to push that view far away to see what you're talking about. And I know that I definitely have, you know, what I call kind of the the waves and the dips. And I've just learned to know to lean into the dips and I'll tell you during COVID sometimes I, it's just felt really uncomfortable that I get, I think I know how long the dip is going to last and then it lasts a little longer and I start getting panicky and then I come out of it and I'm like, I forgot about that. But I don't feel like I'm as skilled at being able to really push the lens out to be able to see the overall growth that I've made. I mean, I, I get spurts of it, but I think that's just something that I don't think about. And I'm wondering if the intensity of how I feel things keeps that view up close and that I've, if if it wouldn't be more helpful for me to really start practicing pushing that further back. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And actually, as you were talking, I was thinking very much about my experience with an assessment tool called the Clifton Strengths Finder. Mm -hmm. I suspect you and I probably have a similar strength in connectedness. In, In the Strengths Finder approach, they describe connectedness as being able to find those connections between concepts and ideas and and kind of weave them together. And it sounds like you and I both share that as a top strength. But that's very different than being able to kind of zoom out and take a wide lens or a wide angle to viewing life events. I think that probably falls more under kind of a, a strategic or even a futuristic strength that Clifton Strengths Finder describes. And I suspect probably your strength is really immersing yourself in the here and now and and seeing the details and being fully present. And that itself is a strength, but every strength has a shadow side, right? I think it's about cultivating our natural strengths and learning how maybe to compensate for the shadow sides that come with them so that we can really become a more balanced, more integrated human being. I really like that. I've been in a few groups with you and I've seen in a group where somebody has asked for feedback, your ability to capture what's going on and to articulate it. I, I, I don't even feel like I have the words to express it, but you'll give feedback about what your observation is. And because you have some skill sets that I don't, I'm like, how did you do that? <laughs> like it, it feels like <laughs> magic. How did you see that? How did you know that? And maybe you can speak more articulately to what, if I'm even giving you enough information, because I feel like I don't even have the language to describe what I've watched you do, but I've had that like, wow, that's kind of magic. Well, thank you. First off, thank you. That is a huge compliment that you've just given me and, and I receive it with gratitude. So thank you for that. I suspect for me, when I'm in those moments, I do think there it's that connectedness piece. I'm able to connect moments or observations or ideas or concepts that maybe the other person hasn't seen the connection between and then kind of back out from it. And this is where maybe some objectivity comes into play. And I'll be honest with you, earlier in my life, earlier in my career, I think one of my strengths of empathy sometimes interfered with that because I would join so closely with the other person and I would immerse myself in their world that I wasn't always able to view it from that outside position. And in the therapy room, being able to join with them in that way served me really well. But as I became a more seasoned therapist, and now certainly as a coach, I've had to really notice when that strength of empathy serves me and when I need to be aware of it causing me to to join too much 
so that I lose that objectivity. And that is something that I have intentionally cultivated over the last four years as I've stepped into my power as a coach and as a business owner. And that comes with practice, certainly. I mean, any skill requires practice, whether it's learning to play the piano or learning to set boundaries or learning to view things from an objective stance. It it just requires practice. And I think it also meant connecting even more deeply with my inner wisdom because my inner wisdom, my intuition is always spot on. And when I can connect that with that external objectivity, I feel like that's where my power lies. That's that's where that magic comes in. And so it all works in tandem. It all works together. I suspect maybe that's what, what you've described seeing in, in the groups together is really my conscious effort to build my objectivity, but also to create space for my intuition as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have like a million places that I want to go with this. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see that I have, it's a, it's a parallel gift. And I think that you were right where that the gift of connectedness and there are places where like I see patterns that other people don't. And then I have a friend who will be talking about something and they see a different aspect that helps me pull things together even more. So my guess is probably many of us that are in the healing professions, therapy, coaching have this ability and it may be broader, it may be more narrow. But I was thinking about, well, two things. When I hear therapists talk about getting overwhelmed, feeling fatigued in their therapy sessions, I'm wondering if part of that is is that over empathy and the joining and not being able to create some some sense of distance because we join so much that we take it on. Do you have any thoughts about that? I think that is a fair and probably accurate assessment. And I can speak to it anecdotally from my experience 100% when I would over identify with a client or a client situation to the point where maybe even I took that situation on as my own burden. That's what made me feel wiped out and exhausted and burned out. And I would say there are certain areas where that's more likely to happen. I did spend a couple years working for the Air Force Family Advocacy Program, which is the domestic violence and child abuse prevention and intervention program. So when I would get too involved in spouse abuse or child abuse cases, and I would start taking it on as my own, that's when I started feeling exhausted and burned out. I didn't necessarily have those issues with other uh, approaches or, or other client populations that didn't feel as emotionally charged for me. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I I think you're definitely onto that. And coupled with the fact that especially at that time in my life, I really defined my self-worth and my identity on the extent to which I could serve and support other people. And to the point where like whether I was a success or whether I was a failure had to do with other people's outcomes and how much I could help them with that. And that's a recipe for disaster. When you are pinning your self-identity on someone else's outcome, then at least in my case, it just it led to a lot of unhappiness. And I suspect that may also play into feeling overwhelmed and burned out and burdened. I would say in any relationship where we have an investment in the out in the other person's outcome, either them listening to our advice, following our advice, doing what we think is best. That is just a setup for disaster. And if we take it back into the therapy room, so much of what I think the foundation of a healing relationship is, is us creating space for people to show up and be however they are. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you look on the continuum from, in my mind, from therapy to coaching, I see it as a progression of on one end of the continuum, people that have a lot of wounding that are very overwhelmed by their feelings. They get identified with them and can't see that they're identified with them. And they just need someone to hold space to moving to a place where somebody goes like, Oh, I'm starting to get identified. What do I need to do to somebody that goes like, Oh, this is an activation for me. This is what I do when it happens all the way along. But especially in the early stages of the relationship, being able to be present and hold space for somebody is where I think that that transformation starts. And so many times therapists get their sense of, efficacy on the movement that they make with clients or feeling like clients are just coming into chit chat or they're not making progress. And if there are attachment issues and relational issues, we're setting that foundation for them as therapists that we need to start somewhere and move forward. Yes, I think you're exactly right. And and I, I want to pause for a moment and just reflect back how much I love the way you just described 
the therapy to coaching progression. And it's very much in alignment with how I view it too. From an acceptance and commitment therapy-based perspective, I am still very interested in this idea of fusion and the extent to which we fuse with a thought or an emotion or an event. And I'm thinking about a question uh, I got from one of one of my Coach with Clarity members recently. She was asking about trauma and coaching. And can she coach someone who has a trauma history or is recovering from trauma? And again, when we think about a traumatic event, so often we fuse our identity and our self-concept with that event. And it becomes very difficult to separate who we are from what happened to us. And therapy is the place where we can start to untangle all of that. And we can start to see the event as something separate that, yes, had an influence or an impact on us, but doesn't have to define us. That's the work of therapy. And the once those threads are kind of untangled and we want to move forward, I suspect that's where coaching can really come in. When you're working with someone who has the awareness of, oh, look, I'm starting to fuse to that old way again. What do I need to do to kind of, you know, redirect myself and chart a new course? I love that we're talking about this because I still feel very inarticulate when I try and verbalize the difference between therapy and coaching. And I was thinking before we recorded that every time I have an agenda, it really doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like I'm wanting, like I'm wanting a guest to make a point that I can't articulate. So I just want to own that up front that every time I try and do this, it fails miserably. But I, I love what you're saying. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. And I have a little bit of an agenda around when the definition of therapy is about the past and coaching is about the future, because for HSPs, we get so many negative messages that we do need to go back and look at that. And sometimes for me, coaching involves people crying and being upset because we're looking at where these messages came from and changing them so we can move people into the future, but they're not stuck in that identification. They're functioning very well. They may be very successful. They've got some areas where they struggle with, but they're not so identified that they get stuck in these ruts. And I I feel so sensitive in saying this if somebody's listening and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm one of those people that's stuck in a rut. And I, I don't know how to talk about this without potentially having somebody over identify or misidentify. So I I just want to name that. I appreciate that. And, and I think when we name it and we enter into this conversation from a place of, this is my perspective. This is my view. If it doesn't match yours or if I've said something wrong, educate me so that I can do better next time. So we'll enter this conversation with that spirit, right? Yes. And I also want to acknowledge that it can be difficult to differentiate between therapy and coaching because inarguably there's some overlap. Some of the skills and tools we use are the same. Even some of the th- theoretical approaches that are used in coaching have roots in therapy. And, and now we're seeing vice versa as well. So there is some overlap. There is some gray zone. And I don't think we'll ever be able to get to a point where we can always and 100% with clear certainty, like differentiate between the two and know where someone should go. So that's why I think coaches in particular are under the obligation to understand when they start crossing from coaching into more of a therapy world and what that looks like, and then what steps they need to take to ensure that their client is safe and receiving the appropriate services. And I will say that the International Coaching Federation, which is really the main professional organization for coaches, certainly in in the United States, but really worldwide, they do have a white paper for coaches on when to refer clients to mental health. So they are aware of this as an issue. They have position statements and, and that white paper, as I mentioned, and in coaching programs that are accredited by ICF, that is something that gets addressed within the training program so that ICF credentialed coaches understand, okay, yes, there's some overlap, but when this starts happening, we really need to have a conversation about whether a mental health referral is appropriate. From my perspective, certainly, if someone is experiencing distress or dysfunction that is actively impeding their ability to get through the day, then that's probably 
No, that's that is better suited for therapy. And and so anytime and and this is where having that kind of clinical background I think serves me because I am able to talk to my clients and and listen with that clinician ear and say, "Okay, you know what? We're we're kind of getting into diagnostic territory right now." And anytime I feel that pull to diagnose or to put my therapist hat on, that's again, I'm I'm checking in with my intuition and it's like, okay, we need to have a conversation about which path is going to be more appropriate for this person right now. I think sometimes though, we have clients who have had difficult experiences or maybe have some some issues with emotion management or with anxiety that maybe in a in a therapeutic setting might be termed subclinical. And it's it's there, it impacts their life. It's not really interfering with their functioning, but they also get a sense that like they're just not achieving what they want in their lives. They're just not hitting their full potential because there's this block. And I think a well-trained coach can partner with that person and help them through that initial stuckness or that initial block. And then that person's able to create that that vision and that plan for their future. And the coach can help them achieve that as well. But there is that gray zone of like coming back up to typical functioning and then going just a little over typical functioning. That's that gray zone where I think a therapist or a coach may be effective. And I always come back to the client and respecting the client's autonomy. I know that's what that's a social work principle for sure. And so making sure that the client has all of the information so that they can make the decision that's best for them. Yeah, I would totally agree with you. I do want to have you talk about acceptance and commitment therapy and what that is. But I want to jump on something that you said and then scoot back. Sorry, my... <laughs> My son left for work and he just came home. And so I can see him running in the house. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> I wonder what he forgot because he needed his mask and I told him to get it up. Oh, it was his wallet. He couldn't get on base because he didn't Got have it. his wallet. <laughs> okay. No worries. All right. Mystery solved. This is the disadvantage of looking out at the street when you record. And we'll just leave this in down. No need to cut it out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a little personal story there. I love it. Adds a little color. <laughs> What I'm thinking about, and I'm, I'm feeling a little hesitant to say this, I would venture to say that with highly sensitive people, and I'm, I'm using myself primarily as my model because I seem to attract clients that are very similar to me. And I've worked with quite a number of clients and I just seem to attract people that are similar, which, which works well because it just does. I've had years and years of therapy. I'm functioning well. And I've got this wounding stuff. And I'll tell you, during COVID, my wounding stuff is really being activated. Even when we were talking about people misidentifying that, you know, a friend can tell me, you know, my friend does blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, do I do the same thing? That I think that oftentimes we have this tendency to negatively over-identify with things that don't really fit for us because our depth of processing, our intense feelings, we're having this really big internal world that often people will often say, you know, you look so calm. I mean, this is me and other clients, you know, you appear so calm. I'm surprised to know that so much is going on internally. And like, if you could only see it. And so I find with a lot of HS clients that we're misdiagnosed with depression, with anxiety, it could be our depth of processing, it could be not framing things in a way that, you know, once we learn about the trade, it's like, oh, I am going to process things deeply and I'm not going to just shrug things off and I need to chew things over. You know, this was something that was big and I am having big feelings about it and I need to have them. And then once I have them enough, then I can figure out what the next step is. And I think there's such a, I don't, I can't think of the word. It's not danger, but it's so easy to diagnose and to pathologize behavior that I think is HSPs, especially if we have wounding and we're working through it it just can feel really unclear. And I feel like that's a messy thing to say. And it feels like it's messy in the sense of, I want to put things in a neat boxes and draw a very hard line in the sand. And I just don't feel like I can with this. Yes. I. So I think there's so much in what you just shared. And what really came forth for me was the idea that we really have pathologized sensitivity. And we view being sensitive as being atypical or even abnormal. So within a traditional healthcare system, when something is abnormal, then it needs to be treated. Instead of maybe viewing sensitivity as a perfectly typical, acceptable, quote unquote, normal way of responding, and that the structures and systems that we've set up in our world don't support that type of person. And as a result, they're having feelings and experiences that are uncomfortable, 
uh, at best and traumatic at worst. And it's not because there's anything inherently wrong with them, but we've built a world that doesn't reward sensitivity as a strength. Right, right. And that's so much of what the coaching aspect is about is educating about the trait of being an HSP and that how we're in the minority. And so we do get all of these messages. And so how do you dial down to what you what goes on for you to own it to be okay with it, and then to learn how to respond when other people give you the message about well, you're you're too and it's like, yeah, what does that bring up for you? So that we're normalizing and validating and teaching skills to navigate being in a minority and feeling really okay about that. I, I think I think that's true. And and I, I'm attuned to this, I mean, certainly from the perspective of HSPs, but I think there are many populations out there, vulnerable populations, oppressed, marginalized communities that could say the same thing, that our society has set them up to be the other, has set them yes. up to be wrong. You know, it's it's been weighing very heavily on me what I see on the media in terms of how people of color are treated in our Mm -hmm. society. And, you know, I, as, as a white woman, I feel compelled to be part of the the group of people that are saying like, this is wrong. This it's, it's just wrong. It needs to stop. Sadly, it's not surprising. It's not shocking. This is what happens when we have societies that are built on hierarchies and, and power and so forth. But there are so many ways that we build a world that rewards kind of your typical heteronormative white male behavior, that when anyone is outside of that, they're seen as being problematic or diagnosable or unacceptable. And they are the ones that have to shape shift in order to come into alignment with these social norms. And I think it's time for all of us to, to really start questioning the, the systems and structures that have been put into place, certainly with regard to how we're treating people of color and other marginalized communities. But I do think it's fair to say that that people who identify as highly sensitive experience that in a different way, but in a way as well. I totally agree with you. I'm refraining that I'm really wanting to go on a tirade and a rant because of I know what's me going too. On. I had to like, I had to stop myself. <laughs> I know. So I've been debating like, do we let why don't we name it? I want to acknowledge it. And, and I've really been wanting to do an episode on this. I don't think I want to do it in this one. But I think I think the thing to do is, do you want to name what is it what it is that's going on? Let's acknowledge it. And that I do want to create a space to talk about this, because it really needs to be talked about. But I, I want to keep the focus on what we're talking about. But I do want to honor it. I appreciate that. I think the best way to name it and honor it is to say the name. When we're recording this, it is just a few days after the brutal murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, who was suffocated by a police officer's knee on his neck, who was crying out in pain, who asked for help and instead was essentially lynched. Yep. I think it's really important. And and Patricia, I suspect you feel the same way, but because we are white women it is particularly important that we stand up in solidarity with our brothers and sisters of color and say, this is not okay. And then we need to talk to our white brothers and sisters and say, this is not okay. What are we going to do to change this? Because again, it comes back to the systems that have been set up to support whiteness as the dominant power. And it's not fair to expect people of color to have to do the work to change it. Like we Mm -hmm. need to be a part of that solution as well. So that's what I want to name. And I want to thank you for kind of giving space to, to talk about that. No, I appreciate I'm, I'm tearing up right now because it just, it, it is just so hurtful and white protesters can be on the Capitol with guns and there's a tweet from our federal leadership about, isn't it great that people have the right to share their perspective. And a football player can't take a knee in respect without Mm -hmm. having negative consequences. And a black man is saying, I can't breathe and he's cuffed and there's no reason why he couldn't have been let up. I I just, I don't even have words. This is, I have so much white privilege. It's not something I talk about very much. I'm very inarticulate in my language, but I can tell you on a heart level, it just makes my heart hurt beyond words. I feel that Patricia, I feel that too. And so, yes, let's make space for it. Let's honor it. And then let's do our part to dismantle the systemic racism that's baked into our our communities. Yeah, I've already signed a couple of 
political things that went around today asking for change and to look at what happened. And if you're friends with me on Facebook, there are at least six posts that I've shared about some things that have happened recently because it just, it hurts my heart and it is so unfair. And I I think that COVID has really shown even more so the inequities. If you look at the populations that are getting hard hit with COVID because they're underserved in the conditions that they live in and that limited access to healthcare and that these are the people that are on the front line and the proportion of people of color and Hispanic people, Latinos that are being affected are in higher rates than their, po- you know, how, how they show up per capita in, in the world. So <sighs> F you I, COVID. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, really. But, but Patricia, I want to thank you because I think this was a, a necessary and important tangent that we just took. This certainly was not something that I think you or I <laughs> intended to discuss during our, our interview today. And yet it just feels so necessary and so important. Yeah. And I want to thank you for creating the space to allow us to kind of go there. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for bringing it up. And it's, you know, we feel things and it sucks. Okay. So hearts, prayers, changes in policy, activism. Let's, let's talk about this and make some change. I want to drop back. Can you For the people that aren't familiar with ACT, can you briefly explain what that is? Sure. ACT stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And many people refer to it as being part of the third wave of cognitive behavioral therapy. And what makes it part of the third wave is its inclusion and even focus on mindfulness and and I would say mindset as well as tools. So Stephen Hayes is really the the forefather of ACT, though there are many other wonderful ACT therapists and educators out there as well. It's something that I was introduced to back in 2009 when I worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs, and ACT was one of the two kind of VA-sanctioned approaches for use with depression and trauma with veterans. Now, again, this was back in 2009. So things have probably changed since then. And I'm sure there are other approaches now as well. But then I was able to take a training in exposure therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, or acceptance and commitment therapy. And ACT really resonated with me even before I really understood what it was all about. And so I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to complete a six-month traineeship through the VA in acceptance and commitment therapy. Not only did it change how I worked with my clients, but it really changed my life and how I viewed myself and my relationship with myself and my relationships with other people and everything and everyone around me. And I have done a lot of work with ACT, both as a clinician and and now as a coach. I wrote a book called ACT on Your Business, where I looked at taking the principles of ACT and applying them in a business or entrepreneurial setting. And for me, it really comes down to the three M's, meaning, mindset, and mindfulness. Those are really the pillars of ACT. So meaning is about core values. What really matters to you, the values that you embody and want to live out in in your work and in your life. And it's not just knowing your values, but it's also taking action that's aligned with those values. And how do we make decisions and how do we move forward in a way that's value aligned? So that's one component of ACT. That's the meaning pillar. The mindset pillar for me has a lot to do with our internal relationship to our thoughts and to our emotions. And so with our thoughts, we have a tendency to buy into them hook, line, and sinker automatically. And that's that fusion piece that we kind of alluded to before. We fuse with the thought. Whereas with our emotions, when we have an unwanted emotion or sensation come up, it's the opposite. We want to run away from it. We want to avoid it. So we tend to run towards the unwanted thoughts. We tend to run away from the unwanted emotions. And so the mindset work is about bringing our awareness to that and developing a new way of engaging with our thoughts and emotions that allows for some space, allows for greater awareness. And the thoughts and emotions don't become positive or negative. They simply become what they are. It's it's a very neutral way of approaching it. So that's the mindset piece. And then we have the mindfulness piece, which is choosing to interact with ourselves and with other people in a way that promotes present moment awareness, in a way that promotes non-judgment and objectivity. And mindfulness is one of those tricky terms, I think, because it has gotten so much attention uh, in, in pop culture, and many people equate mindfulness with meditation. 
Certainly meditation is one form of mindfulness, certainly not the only form or even the best form for everyone. Really any activity that you engage in that promotes that present moment awareness and non-judgment and objectivity is mindfulness practice. And so when we can bring mindfulness practice into our experience, that changes the way we relate to ourselves through those thoughts and emotions, and it changes the way we relate to others. And that's also where our value-informed activities come in. So those three pillars, meaning, mindset, and mindfulness, really work in harmony with each other to bring balance to a person's life and, and to help them really live from an aligned place. I love that. I often talk about mindfulness and I actually got this from a brain warriors way class that I took with Daniel and Tana Amen about being curious and not furious that something changes in the brain when we can look at it with curiosity. So I often tell clients to imagine themselves like with a little clipboard and their little hat and their little pen and just curiously observing, like being able to almost step out of yourself and watch yourself from above, like just be curious about what happens and let's talk about it. And if you're having resistance or if you're feeling angry and upset, like that's okay. Let's just see what comes up so that we can take a look at it. So I, I, I love that. I love uh, curious, not furious. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Daniel Amonism. <laughs> We're getting close to running out of time. Do you want to take some time to talk about mindset? We had talked about some things we wanted to talk about during the interview. So I just kind of want to give you a little bit of direction here. Sure. What, what would best serve the listeners? What, what, where do you think we should go, Patricia? I love stories, but I didn't really talk to you about having stories to share. I just think that people love to hear stories and to learn through stories. Do you have any examples that you could just come up with off the top of your head? I think actually with your permission, I may go ahead and share a story about myself. I, I could certainly pull on some client stories, but I almost feel like those are their stories to tell. And maybe it would be best if I kind of shared my own kind of mindset story and and kind of transformation there. I think those are the most powerful type of stories and people just often are not comfortable sharing. So if you're comfortable doing that, I would love that. I would be more than happy to. So my whole life, my whole life, I was known as like the smart one. That was definitely an identity that I stepped into when I was a child and even as as a teenager, I was in a in a high school program where I was surrounded by lots of other smart people too. So I didn't have to be the smart one there. Um, and I probably wasn't the smartest one there. And that was actually a very liberating time for me. But one of the problems with being smart and being a smart female and being a young smart female is that you get told that you're too smart for your own good. You're too big for your britches. Um, and that you should kind of make yourself small. And no one really uses that that phrase, make yourself small, but that's baked into the messages that they're telling you. And I didn't realize the extent to which I had received that messaging from society in general, but even from certain teachers or, or other people in my life until it all came to a head in my 20s when I was working as a social worker and I was in, part of a care team of nurses and social workers. There were, there were four of us, two from each discipline. And one of the people on my team one morning just like totally gave me the cold shoulder completely ignored me, wouldn't talk to me. We're in the middle of our, you know, team, our morning team meeting. And like, she wouldn't even make eye contact with me. I was completely shut out. And it went on like that for days. She just refused to speak to me and I had no idea what I had done wrong. Mm. And finally, one of my other team members out of pity, I think basically said, you know, um, this person, she feels like you think you're better than her because you're smarter than her and she thinks you're elitist and she's just kind of had it and project much. Yeah. A well, <laughs> <laughs> little bit. And I can, I can see that now. I really can. And thank you for saying that. It's very validating, but in yeah. the moment that's absolutely not what happened. And, and even now, like I can feel that pit in my stomach and I can feel my cheeks flush because here I am this 25, maybe year old social worker. And I was so ashamed. I was so embarrassed because I thought to myself, no, I don't think I'm better than anyone else. And I mean, I'm a social worker for Pete's sake and I'm here to help people and support people. And who is she to say this about me? And, and is it true? And oh my God. And like it happened 
on a, my coworker shared that with me on a Friday and I went home and I stewed over it all weekend. Like I have Mm. vivid memories of just kind of sitting in my bed and, and it washing over me. And the message that I took was that I had done something really wrong by speaking the way I did and, and stating my opinions and being bold and being out there. And that doing so cost me friendships. It negatively impacted other people because it was affecting my whole work team. And so the message I got was, I need to be quiet. I need to be small. I can't, you know, be big and bold and 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 claim my strengths because if I do so, it's going to hurt other people. And that message at 25 really shaped my young adulthood. And it certainly connected with messages that I had earlier in my childhood, but that was the big one. And for the next 10 years, I I don't think at the time I understood, I, I do now in retrospect, but that really informed how I showed up in work relationships and in friendships and personal relationships. I really felt like I had to apologize for being who I was. I had to apologize for being intelligent or making connections. And and I couldn't do too much or I would expose myself and that wasn't safe. And so from a mindset perspective, those were the messages that I was feeding myself or that my brain, my mind was giving me like, careful, you know, if you say something too smart, you're, you're going to wind up getting burned. And it took a lot of unpacking that to realize that just because my mind said it and just because someone else said it didn't make it true. And that there was a way for me to claim my strength and claim my power without it adversely affecting other people. Man, that was a process of several years of kind of uncovering and unfolding and really shifting my mindset around it because I had then internalized this message that to be powerful was bad. And mm-hmm. that when we have power, it means we have power over others. That that was my limited view of power. And so I spent a couple years um, as I was building my coaching practice, really unpacking what it meant to own one's power what it meant to own one's strengths and how to do so in a way that's authentic and service oriented. Because now that 25 year old me feels she's a part of me, but I feel so distant from how she viewed that because now it's like, well, of course we claim our power. That's how, that's how we all rise, you know, and I can be powerful and you can be powerful too. And Mm -hmm. so that's really been my big mindset journey, I think, over the last five years is redefining my relationship with with intelligence, with power and with myself. It's such a beautiful story. I'm curious to know, looking back, do you feel that there was anything that you were doing to contribute to the situation? I love that you asked that question, Patricia, because I think the answer is yes. I do think I contributed to it. I think I was coming from a state of ignorance in that I didn't fully understand how my actions were affecting others or how others were interpreting them. And so I did just kind of, you know, maybe I would make a oh, an offhand or witty remark and not think about the impact on others. There's a way to do that, to be aware and sensitive to the impact on others without owning that other person's experience and and taking responsibility for it. And that's something I think now in my 40s, I'm much more comfortable with that kind of nuanced approach. There's a way for me to be aware of my impact on others and to be sensitive to that without owning their interpretations. Um, Because it's not a license to go out there and say whatever you want. And, you know, if people get hurt, well, that's on them. Like that's kind of going to the polar opposite. But there has to be a way for all of us to say what we believe, to stand in our strengths, but also have that objectivity and that awareness of of that ripple effect that we create with our words and with our actions. I totally didn't expect you to answer that way. So now I feel like I like I gave you a shovel to dig a hole in that I really didn't like that. <laughs> I didn't expect no, you no, to no, go. No, no, not at all. Not at so all. I'm like and I'm kind of like, holy crap, how do, how do I undo this? So let me... Oh, no need to not, undo. No need to undo, really. I'm, well, I'm, well, I'm no. fine. I promise. Well, no, because I mean, this is a really deep thing, but I, my guess is that listeners are curious about this. So if you're okay talking about it a little bit, I, I, I want to clarify, because I, I do think that we have a right to show up in the world exactly as we are, and that when people have issue with us, 
we do need to look at, is there something that I'm saying or doing? And when you first started to share the story and I said, like project much that often when people have that sense of us being too, whatever it is, it often doesn't, you know, it's always relative. And so it's also about how much space other people can have for each other. So honestly, it was not my intention to have you kind of shift the narrative around that. And there are things like how I showed up in my twenties and how I show up now, my kids have girlfriends and I can identify with how they show up. And I think, "Mm, isn't that interesting? (laughs) That's all I'm going to say. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I think that there is this confidence that comes with youth. And then we get a little older and we go like, "Mm, maybe I need to change a little bit how I show up. But I, I guess the message that I really want the listeners to have is that we can own our power. We can have strong feelings. We can be assertive. We can set boundaries. We can be very powerful and, and clear about who we are and what works for us. And we don't have to be hurtful to others, aggressive, unpleasant. And I think that that's often the misnomer that comes up that I can be very clear about what works for me and be incredibly kind to other people and still stay true to what is true for me. And I, I think that was where I was expecting you to go, but I, like I said, I gave you a shovel and (laughs) (laughs) not at all, not at all. And and I think, I think you're exactly right. And and I will say something else that I've learned in my journey is that, and, and the mindset work and the mindfulness work has been a key part of that. It's made me really aware of my own judgments as well, because as human beings, we are hardwired to judge. That's what our mind does. It's why we have survived as a species, as long as we have, we judge our environment, we determine whether it's safe or unsafe, and we take action accordingly. I think though our minds can go into overdrive and become these little judgment factories and we judge everything and everyone around us. And so having that awareness of, okay, the process of judging is understandable. The results of judging are what we do have control over and the extent to which those judgments influence our behavior. And what I've really found for myself, at least, is that when I judge someone or when I have a strong reaction to something, it's really telling me much more about me than it is Mm -hmm. about the other person. And so whatever I'm judging in someone else is likely an area I feel deficient in or I feel sensitive to. It really becomes more of a more of a, a lighthouse, a beacon, really, you know, of something that I need to do some work on within myself. And so I suspect maybe the in, when I think back to what happened with me when I was 25, m- the way I came across was really kind of one of those moments for that other person. And and whatever it was I said or did kind of responded in in a judgment that she formed and then she reacted accordingly. And and now I'm able to kind of look back on that and say, well, yeah, it makes sense. And and it's, you know, it didn't feel good in the moment. And yet it's also okay. And I can forgive it. I can forgive her. I can forgive my 25 year old self. And I find it really liberating to view judgment that way. And and it gives me kind of a path through it as well. No, I, I totally agree with you. And it's like, if I said, Lee, your hair is green, you'd go like, I don't know. Well, Lee, your hair is green. <laughs> and be like, okay, okay, Patricia, sure. <laughs> From your perception, maybe it is. But like, for me, I know that's not my truth. Right. And so that just would roll off. But if I said something that was going to attach to one of your previous woundings about like, well, that was kind of, a, you know, like, yeah, you're being smart again, you know, that, yeah. that that may activate something. And then you get to look at, you know, did I say something? Is this about me? Is this about Patricia? You can ask a question for clarification. Patricia, what, what do you mean by that? And then you're going to get more information about where I'm coming from. So it's, it's always relative to something else. And like you said, if it's something like you've got green hair, we know that that's absolutely not true. It doesn't stick. And so when it does stick, we get to look at why is it sticking? And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's about us anyways. It could be historical. So we get to get curious and get information about it. Yes. And to circle back to something you said earlier about therapy and coaching and past and future and all of that, because by the way, I totally agree with you. I think the whole therapy is about the past and coaching is about the future is an incredibly reductive way to view it because there are so many therapists out there who are very solution focused, very present moment and even future oriented. So to say that therapy is only about the past does a disservice to therapy. And likewise, in coaching, there are moments where we have to look at our past events and our past habits because they inform 
who we are today and how we respond to the world. So there is room for that kind of past awareness and coaching. But again, we're not going in to do the deep healing work of the past or trying to untangle identity from past events. For me, that's very much the territory of therapy. But in coaching, we are able to look back at a past event and say, okay, so when this message was given to you when you were eight years old and you internalized it, it makes sense that it then shaped your worldview and the way you think about yourself. So where do we go from here? Now that you have that awareness, where do we go from here? What do you want to do today? What do you want to do tomorrow? And that's how as coaches, we can acknowledge and and bring the past into our work without it becoming therapeutic. I love that. I think that makes sense. I was thinking about the analogy of if, if a coach were doing money mindset with someone, you have to look at what messages you got as a kid about money and value and saving and spending. And there may be some pain that gets unraveled about maybe as a kid, you really wanted something and you couldn't have it, that there is a way that that can tie into looking at the past, some wounds, but not being stuck in those wounds, but having to do some healing work so that you can look at your mindset, your beliefs, change them and then create what you want moving forward. It just, I just want a really clear, perfect, clean, firm definition. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can want it. (laughs) I want it too. I want it too. And yet part of being human, I think, is getting comfortable with discomfort and with uh, ambiguity and finding our way forward anyway. I tell you, and I'll, I'll tell you, COVID has just created a whole new layer of acceptance and humanity and going with the flow. And I mean, it really is unearthing all kinds of stuff for every well, for many of us. Yeah, it's it's that regression. It's that retrograde period for many of us. And I, I think that idea too, of, of bringing things into balance, while so many of us are, are having those experiences, we can also look at ways in which our world is, is healing. I mean, just look mm-hmm. at the, the reduced pollution effects and, and what's happening with, with some of the forests and, and so forth. I mean, there is healing that's happening as some of us are having to kind of deal with our own internal as well. It, so it, again, it's it's about balance, right? It's all about balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and the other thing is that people are finding that teleworking is really helpful. I think companies are going to start doing that for people to get overstimulated, having a lifestyle that's slowed down. It's allowing things to come up that many people would cover up because of their busyness and their doing. So I, I, I think it's a both and. I think almost everything in life mm-hmm. is a both and. So, yep. yeah. Lee, shifting gears, why don't you tell the listeners about your book, your podcasts, uh, your coaching program, anything else that you have, and then I'll make sure that there are links to everything in the show notes. Well, thank you, Patricia. I appreciate that. So I am the founder and CEO of Coach with Clarity, which is a coach training and business coaching company. So while I do some uh, one-on-one coaching with individuals, what I really love to do is provide coach training. And I do so through the Coach with Clarity membership, which is an ICF accredited continuing coach education provider. And I'll be unrolling some other training op- opportunities uh, in uh, late 2020 as well. So you can learn more about that and about me at coachwithclarity.com or you can follow me on Instagram at coachwithclarity. And if our discussion today about acceptance and commitment therapy interests you, then I do think you'd probably really enjoy my book, which you can get on Amazon. It's called Act on Your Business, Braving the Storms of Entrepreneurship and Creating Success Through Meaning, Mindset, and Mindfulness. And spoiler alert, even though I've got the word business in the title, this really is a book about how to bring those three M's to your life and how to change your relationship with yourself podcasts. You can find me coach with clarity, (laughs) wherever you like to listen, download, subscribe, just search coach with clarity, you'll find it. And then there's also more information about the podcast at coachwithclarity.com. Love it. Lee, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on before we end today? I know we've been all over the board in a wild adventure. We really have. I mean, we have covered so much today and and I'm just grateful for the space and the time and the ability to connect with you. I, I feel like our conversation is is complete and perfect just as it is. Sounds great. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Patricia. All right. Bye-bye. Hey again. So I'm curious to know what you thought of the episode. Are there any of you that have been curious about the difference between therapy and coaching? If you're either a person who 
is not a professional or if you're a coach or a therapist, was that helpful for you? I really do love the conversation that we have. And I wish I had, you know, like my little elevator speech about the difference. And anytime I have a potential client that reaches out to me, I just feel so messy when I try and explain the difference. But this really helped me to nail it down a little bit more. I'm curious to know also what you thought about the idea of empathy and how it may work against us when we have too much empathy and we join either with a client, if we're a therapist or a coach or in friendships, that sense of having to fix people or being invested in the outcome as opposed to just being present and allowing, even if it's friends, parents, children to have their experience and to know that they are able to make their own decisions and we can support them and that we really don't have to take that heavy role of responsibility of having them listen to it our advice or do what we think is best for them. Because even when we think we know, everybody has a right to follow their own path. And goodness knows I've made a fair share of my own mistakes that I'm sure people looked at and could see it coming. And I just needed to do it for myself. I don't know. Curious to know what your thoughts are. Many of you have been reaching out to me over some of the episodes that I've released. I love hearing from you. Thank you for the feedback. Somebody said I had mad lady balls. I didn't even know that was such a thing. And it just made me smile and I posted on social media. So feel free to reach out to me at unapologetically sensitive at gmail.com. We have the closed Facebook group called unapologetically sensitive. There's some great things going on in that community. If you heard things and you feel like it might be helpful to talk to somebody, please feel free to reach out to me. I provide a free 20 minute consult. I work online with people all over the world. A lot of the things that Lee and I talked about are things that I can help you. And I think it's really about learning about the trait of being highly sensitive or whatever it is that shows up for you and figuring out if you have some wounding or some tender spots around that, how to work with those those things, how to learn how to respond when people give us messages that may be unkind or insensitive, and how we really can embrace who we are and to step into our power in a way that helps us feel like we have a right to be here and to take up space without having to step on anybody. I think what Lee talked about of we can, we can both have power. We can both be assertive. We can both have boundaries. And it doesn't mean that it's, it's the, at the expense of somebody else that both of those things can exist. And I think many of us have the experience of one person has power and one doesn't and power is at the expense of somebody else. And I think that when we're really clear about who we are and what works for us, We can be kind, loving, we can be gentle and firm. If you think about parenting, it's possible to parent in a firm, kind, loving manner. You don't have to scream at your kids. You don't have to beat them. You don't have to punish them. You don't have to threaten them, but you can stand clear on what the rules are and still be compassionate. Anyways, that's my spiel. I hope during this time of COVID, you are having some pockets of peace and comfort and security. Ah, Deep breath. This is a both and situation. And because I'm talking to people almost every day about the challenges that they're experiencing around COVID, I think that's more present for me. So if you're feeling like you need some soothing, some comforting, some nurturing, we will get through this. We are working on this. We're doing the best that we can right now. It's going to be challenging if we can bring in as much gentleness and self-compassion Find places where you feel seen and heard. Find communities where people are like you so that you have that sense of connection. There are places. I'm I'm in some of them. I've created some of them. I don't mean that in a braggadocious way. I just am loving to see the communities that I'm in unfolding and just being incredibly supportive and validating for people. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a listener. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day.